Hi, welcome back to the Introduction to Spacey series. This is part three. In the first video, we started with a function that was able to detect whether or not uh, the Go language was in a document. And the main thing that we used that worked quite well here was the part of speech tag. The Go language, you know, the Go is, it could be a verb, and if it's a verb, it's probably not a programming language. And we noticed that Spacey was nice because we can do more than just basic string matching. We then extended the idea by not having a function detect this, but by having a matcher object uh, detect this. So essentially you have these dictionaries where you essentially declare what you want. And we, f we found out that we were able to detect Go, but the main benefit of this was that we weren't just detecting Go, but also something like Objective-C, which could potentially span across multiple tokens. That's now also something we were able to detect. The goal of this session is slightly different. Uh, I, I don't want to explore the problem too much. Like I think I've got a pretty valid approach. But what I want to do is wrap the approach up uh, and to properly evaluate it. Because I think that there are at the moment uh, a couple of low hanging fruits that I can probably pick up with this approach with the matcher. I also think it would be good if I could understand the shortcomings of the matcher approach. I would like to at least be aware of it. And third, I think that if we probably want to be able to compare our approach with another approach, uh, say something with deep learning, um, then at the very least we should have metrics such that we can properly compare. So in this video I will touch on these topics uh, and there will be a slight emphasis on labeling. Um, it's often not done by the algorithm designer and I think that's kind of a real shame because typically if you do the labeling yourself as you're designing the algorithm, there's many lessons that you could learn. So in this video, I hope to show you what the benefits of this sort of way of working might be. So let's get started. So I'm back in my Jupyter notebook, and there's a few things that should feel familiar if you've seen the previous videos. I have my data frames with all of my questions about programming languages from Stack Overflow. I have my NLP object, uh, where I'm loading in a language model from Spacey. And I've got my matcher object, and here's all sorts of dictionaries that describe tokens that I would like to get matched. There's a few for Objective-C, there's a few for the Go programming language, but this collection of patterns will be used by this matcher object. Uh, and what I can do is I can detect whether or not a certain document is matched. Now I do that below here, and I'm using a similar generator trick as from the other videos. I am uh, doing nlp.pipe, give that all the titles that I've got. And if the matcher detects uh, that something is matched in this document, then I will keep it in this generator. And this is sort of my quick way of just listing all sorts of documents where something has been matched. And if I look at the top 10, eh, there's, there's some stuff I expect. So there's Ruby here, for example. And I think that's the reason why Ruby got picked here. But for this, uh, I'm a little bit less certain because technically JavaScript it's probably the reason why this, this was chosen. Um, but I'm kind of wondering now about C Sharp because that's also a programming language. Uh, it's just that it, it might not be matched right now. So in this particular case, I kind of feel like making a slightly better user interface for my purposes. So what I will do now is I'll just do a little bit of a hack uh, and just write some custom Jupyter code such that this is uh, shown in a slightly different way. So I have made a modest extension of Jupyter. Uh, and essentially what I've done is because I know when the matcher has a start and an end when it's detected something, um, I can take the tokens that are matched and just give them a slightly different background color. Uh, and, and I can also print the text in bold fashion. The IPython display that you, uh, module that you can import has an HTML print method. And this sort of allows you to write your own custom print statements uh, in a way. And the reason why you're able to do this is because Jupyter runs from the browser. Now, the only thing that's really different is the way that uh, I print things now. So instead of a for loop, I now have an HTML generator that gets printed. But when I now run this, I kind of have a slightly nicer user interface, at least for me, um, such that I can definitely see like, hey, yeah, this is JavaScript, that's what's being detected and not this C sharp over here. Um, and that's great because this, this sort of helps me explore and this sort of uh, makes it a bit more evident for me uh, how the approach that I have works. Now, 
this will be different for everyone. Uh, I think that this is why I like Jupiter so much. It's quite easy for me to extend. But it is a nice uh, idea to at least be conscious of how you want to explore the behavior of your model. And for language, I think this is a fairly, albeit hacky, nice way to sort of explore it. So right now, at least I have the impression, hey, I, I should totally get C Sharp as a language um, in, in, in what I've got. So what I will do now is I'll just spend a little bit of time looking for some of these low hanging fruits. I'll just be looking for things where I might go, hey, yeah, that, that should be detected. Let's put that in there. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll do that now. Yeah, so found a couple more. So C++, C Sharp and Java. Those are not detected. Oh, Perl, there you go. It's also one that's not being detected. .NET again, C, okay, there's ASP.NET, and okay, bunch of stuff. So what I will do now is I will just make sure that the languages that I have found, oh, there's HTML, <laughs> also one. Um, I will just make sure that the languages that I've got here, that those are now also uh, added here. This is going to be extended now, because um, these are just some low-hanging fruit. This should just be added, really. So off camera, I've, I've repeated this process uh, a couple of times uh, and I have found HTML, CSS, uh, C Sharp, F Sharp, C, C++, .NET, whole bunch of things, uh, PHP, ASP.NET. Um, some of these programming languages could be multiple tokens technically. So I've just made a lot of patterns here um, and I've added them all to the matcher. Um, and I have a fair bit of confidence that I now cover more um, scenarios with my approach. So that's that, that gives, uh, gives me a good feeling. But even though uh, this approach is very convenient uh, and it gives me a bit of an overview, uh, it might be good now to move on to a next step. So the idea is to uh, be a bit more formal about this and actually label this manually and, and sort of iterate on that instead. Uh, because right now I'm just looking at uh, the positive instances. Um, I think labeling is a, is a good thing to do now. The next step what I will do is I will uh, label some of these instances. And out of curiosity, I just want to check uh, if I take the first 2000 rows, how many rows does the matcher currently already uh, match? Okay, we, we get about one out of four instances seems to be matched already. So that's convenient. I'm not, I'm not labeling for super rare events and that, that, that's convenient to check. And in terms of labeling, what I essentially would like to have, um, uh, it's, it's truncated, which is a bit of a shame, but uh, there will be a sentence here and I would like to have another column called label, uh, which I will then uh, have a zero if uh, there's no programming language in the title and I'll have it be a one if there is a programming language in the title. Um, Right now, I think the most convenient and also just the let's just get started quickly way of doing that is to just put it into Excel. Um, so what I could just go ahead and do is I can uh, take my data frame and save it into a file called uh, this label it <laughs> uh, .csv or something. Uh, and then I can open it up in Excel and, and just do the labeling from there. Now, it should be said that uh, there's also other tools to do labeling. Uh, definitely Prodigy. I, uh, it's a likable tool. Um, but the goal of this video is just to show how to uh, do this quickly and yourself. And for this particular instance, I think Excel can be just fine. So I will drop the ID column and then I will uh, save this into uh, a CSV file that I will then label. Um, and then I'll open it up in Excel. Okay, so it's loaded up in Excel right now. And one thing I will do is I'll, uh, I'll just put a zero here and then you can double click the lower right hand corner. Uh, and when you're in a situation like this, I guess the cool thing that's kind of nice is um, what I can do is I can just read this sentence and I don't think there's a programming language in there and I can press the down button. Uh, I think this one actually is a programming language. Same thing there. Um, and then there's a C sharp down here. There's another C sharp and you can just press down and you can press a one. And um, in, in terms of like labeling, this is a fairly convenient way of just getting a bunch of labels relatively quickly. So what I will do is I will just uh, make some labels like this right now. And while I'm doing that, I'll just keep track of time 
uh, to also get an impression of how many labels I can do per unit of time. But uh, nothing fancy, just, uh, just making sure I label. So let's get started with that. So I've done some more labeling off camera, uh, but there's a couple of uh, notes that I think are worth sharing. Uh, it seems that I'm, a, I'm able to do about 250 labels every five minutes. And this suggests that, you know, you can get about 2000 labels uh, per hour. That, that definitely seems manageable. Um, I would recommend taking breaks though. Um, thinking about it, at some point you just want to sort of keep on labeling, keep on labeling, and you might be tempted to just do this in a very, very fast manner. Um, I care about the quality of the labels and I would hate to redo the work. Uh, so taking a break every five to 10 minutes seems like a good idea. Um, for now, I've only done 500 labels and this is a conscious decision. Um, so I might have made a mistake in my labeling and this is something I might learn in the moment. So it's probably a better idea to just first label a, little, a, a bunch of things and then see what you can learn from it. Um, I did also learn a very cool lesson as I was labeling because I got a bit suspicious when reading some questions. Uh, a lot of questions uh, about ASP.NET and .NET uh, also included the C Sharp language. Um, so I decided to Google around a bit uh, during a break, and then I kind of discovered that ASP.NET and .NET, uh, they're more like tools, not necessarily a programming language. Um, I would only have been exposed to this um, if I, by doing the labeling myself uh, and by you know caring about the problem and doing all of this research. So in this example, I can definitely imagine that a third party who is, uh, you know, less involved in the uh, application of the problem, um, that, that they're missing some context. Um, and context, uh, in this case, is very valuable uh, and perhaps even needed to solve the problem the right way. Uh, labeling might sound very boring, but in reality, it should be seen as an exciting way to learn about the problem. And this is just one example. Um, getting this stuff right is very, very important. Another thing that might be worth mentioning is that you probably want to save the label data set in a TXT format and make it tab separated. Um, the texts in this data set include commas uh, and this will mess up CSV files big time. So with these uh, notes out of the way, what I'm gonna do now is uh, load up the data set and just uh, run some statistics by it and see if I can learn some things. So I've written the code down that can uh, parse the data set the right way. So I have this uh, tab separated file called have label. Uh, I grab the two columns of interest. I make sure that I only look up a certain number of rows. Uh, and then I have this one column that uh, yeah, describes whether or not the matcher predicts whether or not there's a programming language in the sentence. And I make sure that it's an integer uh, in my data frame. Um, with this, what I can actually do is I can look at some of the mistakes that my model makes. For example, I can check hey, find some instances where there is uh, no prediction, but there is a label that says there is a programming language. And it's actually quite interesting to, to look at these uh, errors. So one thing I did not previously anticipate, but something I definitely see here, is that a programming language could have a version number attached. Uh, so here you see PHP 5, and here you see Delphi uh, 2007. That is something that my current matcher doesn't account for. Uh, I'm currently only matching on the name of the programming language, but I should probably maybe do something with a regex to ensure that I also capture this. Another thing that I notice is that Haskell and Bash are two programming languages that I'm currently not doing anything with, so those should be added. But something else, I mean, I'm actually kind of curious about this one. So let's put that in an NLP and turn it into a list. Yeah, so, so one thing that also kind of goes wrong with this approach is that the tokenizer might have a bit of issues um, properly splitting you know, uh, this into two separate tokens. And I can see why that that might go wrong because it's definitely non-standard English what is happening here. Um, so overall good, but I, I've got some, some improvements I can make. So I'm actually kind of happy with these lessons. So one thing we can do now uh, to, as well is we can flip this. Uh, the idea being that I've just seen one type of mistake and I'm kind of interested what happens when the model says, hey, there is something even though the label disagrees with it. 
So let's do that. And let's also, I think there's more of them. So I can increase that to 15 for now. And yeah. So one thing you see here, um, the model with the matcher, it's, it's, it's detecting SQL here, I think. So you can see there's a SQL there and there's a SQL there and there's a SQL there. But I probably labeled this not as a programming language because SQL Server Database, that is less of a programming language and more like a like a technology tool. Um, and I see that happen here a bunch. There's an interesting problem here where it says SQL Server. So I probably said, ah, because of SQL Server, it's not a programming language, even though .NET definitely is in here. Uh, so this is a mislabeled example, uh, and it's good that I spot that because that gives me the possibility of fixing it. I will say in general, I'm reasonably happy with these results. Although I do think it's nice that I understand why this failure happens. It's something that I can address with a little bit of string matching. So it's not necessarily the hardest problem, but at least understanding that this is kind of the weakness of my current matcher approach, that is very useful. So what I will do now is I'll write some code to address the issues that we had before. So I'll add the programming languages. I will do something with the version numbers. I will fix this label. Um, and then I'll repeat the exercise that I just did. What I hope is that you would agree that again, labeling and, and reviewing this, that that's a very useful process. Something that people probably should do more of. Now, another thing that might be good to do now is to also introduce some metrics. It's, it's, it's pretty cool to sort of qualitatively look at what you're doing, but it's also uh, very useful to have a more quantitative way of looking at it. So typically what you want to do uh, is, you know, get some summary statistics. And for me, uh, you don't have to implement the methods that do this yourself because you have scikit-learn, which is a lovely library that has batteries included for this sort of thing. Um, one thing I typically like to look at uh, is a confusion matrix. Uh, since we're talking here about documents that have been um, labeled as containing a uh, programming language and documents that we have without it, um, it would be good to just compare uh, when do we make certain types of errors and when does the uh, label and prediction really uh, match up. So the way you should read this uh, little summary is um, the real uh, values. Uh, you can find those on the rows, whereas the predicted values are on the columns. So for example, if I look at whatever number is listed uh, over here, uh, that is the situation where we did not have a programming language in the document, but our method seems to think so. Looking at the confusion matrix that we have, I would argue that we seem to be making one type of mistake more than the other type of mistake. And this makes sense, I think. Um, we saw lots and lots of examples uh, of SQL Server happening here. And that is when the method actually is a little bit confused right now because it actually thinks that SQL Server, because SQL is in there, uh, that it's a programming language, even though it's labeled that it's not. This will be addressed, but for now, I will say that, you know, there's one type of error happening more and this, this confusion makes it gives us a bit of a summary. But there are also other things you could have a look at. Um, and the confusion matrix only tells you part of that story. Uh, the other part of the story is often summarized in a classification report that's also in scikit-learn. And that tells us a little bit more about precision recall uh, support and F1 scores. Now, the way that you should read this classification report is that we have some metrics, but we have them per class. So the precision and recall for class zero, that is documents that do not have a programming language in them, is listed here. While the precision and recall uh, of instances that does have the label of a programming language is sort of listed here. Precision and recall are important to understand because they, they, they typically optimize for different things. If you're interested in having a situation where, uh, let's say we are interested in finding all the Python programmers, then essentially you're more worried about recall. A recall basically is, it's kind of like memory. Can I, can I recall all the instances uh, with a programming language? Precision is different. Uh, precision really cares more about if I say that you are a Python programmer, that that statement is accurate. And to explain the difference between these two, it's often useful to think in extremes. So for example, if you want to have a system with perfect recall, what you got to do is just return every single uh, document. 
uh, because if you send back every single document, then you will have perfect recall. All the instances of the programming languages will be in there. The downside is, is that will not be something that has high precision because you're probably gonna have lots of documents in there where there you know, is no programming language. Conversely, um, if I take a single document and for that one document, I'm super certain that, you, that there's a programming language in there, then I have a, you know, a, a, a statement that has very high precision, but horrible recall. Um, as I hope you can appreciate, recall and precision, they, they are typically at odds with one another. An approach that has a high recall typically has a lower precision. Uh, not always, but, but there is a, a sort of uh, exchange happening here between them. You can imagine that, you know, depending on what system that you're designing, uh, you might care a bit more about precision or you might care a bit more about recall. Um, so, for example, if I am automating, let's say, part of a recruitment uh, pipeline um, and, you know, the certain people will get the job, but only if they are supposed to understand Python quite well, theoretically, let's, let's suppose this is how it's going to work, um, then I probably care a little bit more about precision uh, than about recall. Mainly because, you know, when, a, when you automate something, you want to be very sure you're not making mistakes. That again, um, suppose that uh, I work for Stack Overflow uh, and some API change for all the Python users, um, then I might care a little bit more about recall. Because if I, if I reach out to more developers by accident, that wouldn't be the most horrible thing. But you do want to be very sure that most people who do programs uh, in Python are maybe aware of a change. Now, there's also this thing called an F1 score. And for me, at least, the easiest way to think about an F1 score is that's, you know, it's, it's just a sort of weighted average between the two. Um, so if you're interested in balancing the two metrics out, uh, F1s might be a score that you're interested in. The way that you should think about these metrics is that it really depends on the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, there's a very good reason why maybe precision is more important than recall. And just thinking about the problem, I think, is the best way of uh, thinking about it. Now, there's one more thing in this classification report that I have not discussed yet, and that's support. But support is only, you know, the, the total number of uh, instances where we see a, a class of zero or where we see a class of no programming language. Um, so in this case, we again see that it's about 20% uh, of all instances have a, a programming language in them. Um, but in general, if I, if I were now to sort of uh, look at this report, uh, our algorithm is not the worst. Uh, we're definitely so somewhere in the 95 area in terms of recall. Um, but I do definitely worry a little bit about the precision we have for this one class. I should mention, though, that I'm, I'm worried, but I, uh, something that at least, you know, makes me feel a bit better is I also know where this lack of precision comes from. It's the SQL Server issue we saw before. So... Now that we have these metrics, um, what I'm just gonna uh, focus on is taking the lessons we had before. So those are the lessons that we saw here. So this, uh, I think Delphi is a programming language I have to add and bash and, and version numbers and all that. And what I will do after uh, is just do this exercise again. So I'll see what sort of errors I'm still making and I'll check if maybe my metrics have improved. Um, and again, what I hope you appreciate is this iterative approach um, that is mainly the thing I am chasing. Um, it sort of gives me a nice little uh, moment to reflect on what I'm doing. Um, and it's nice to sort of change a thing, measure it, change a thing, measure it. Uh, and that feels like a very productive flow to me. So uh, first up, I'll uh, continue on labeling uh, and then I'll make the fixes. All right, so there's some ASP.NET examples that I gotta remove. There's also a whole bunch more labeling, but I think I, uh, yeah, I've got more labels now, so this, this might be enough. And with the uh, labeling out of the way, what I have done is I have made a function that allows me to add a version number to a programming language. Th there's some details with regex that go outside of the scope of what I'm trying to explain today, but the idea essentially is that you give it a name uh, and then it generates the, the normal just token with uh, the, the name uh, thing that you can match on, but also uh, a variant where there's a proper regex with uh, potential version numbers and another one where uh, the, the programming language is split up and then uh, is followed by uh, something with version numbers. Uh, I've got a small example of just how that runs below. 
It felt like a trick I wanted to generalize, so I made a separate function out of it. Um, and just to confirm that it, whether or not it worked, I'm using my HTML print uh, function that I made before. And as you can now see, I'm now not just matching on Python, but also Python 3.7, uh, Python space 3.6.6. Um, so th th this, this should help out a bit. Um, and I think this is a somewhat elegant way of, uh, of, of dealing with uh, version numbers because it's, it's nice that I can generalize it to a function. Um, so with that out of the way, what I've also done is I essentially, uh, it, you know, made more and more of these patterns. Um, and what I've done is I've, uh, I've, I've put all of my matchers into a single, uh, programming language, um, name, because I didn't feel like I had the need to have so many different programming languages separately added to the matcher. Now, what I can imagine is that you look at this and that you sort of feel that, you know, stuff has gotten a bit more complex and, you know, that uh, this will be slightly uh, hard to um, perhaps maintain and keep track of. And I'll definitely admit that, you know, this uh, we have lots and lots of languages, so we have lots and lots of patterns. Uh, but don't forget that this is still all relatively easy to change, and that's the benefit of it. Um, if I want to add a language, it's arbitrarily easy to do so, uh, even if I'm afraid of some uh, versions that might be attached. Um, <clears throat> so at least for me, this is uh, a pretty good um, sort of iteration uh, to have. And if you know this, this were ever to go to production, um, this is stuff that I could refactor upon. Um, and but but now is not really the time to concern myself too much with that. Uh, I am happy with these uh, versions that I've added. Um, so what I want to do now is just run this matcher with the extra labels that I have uh, and then see uh, where my approach is at. All right, so I have some results. Um, I have some extra labels too. And what I've done is I've just copied and pasted the old results, the old classification summary. Uh, and I have also taken the, the new one. Um, so you can see that I've got more data points, so the, the support number, that, that's definitely higher. Um, and you can also see that in general, uh, both precision and recall and F1 score, the, for every class, they've moderately gone up. Um, the, especially class zero, it seems to be that, that that's highly uh, accurate. So that's no programming language. Um, and it seems that for, as far as programming language detection goes, um, I have about let's say 88% uh, precision, which is, uh, you know, which is, uh, I would argue, a pretty good improvement. Now, in general, I'm still interested in what types of errors I am making here. And it's actually kind of an interesting one. So I'm checking the, uh, the, the type of error that I'm making when I'm making a prediction for a programming language, even though there isn't one. And and essentially, it's that SQL Server thing mostly. But there's also another example here below with Ruby on Rails. Um, and this is kind of an interesting, what problem am I actually solving here type of issue. In general, I can imagine if this was for a recruitment agency, let's say, then maybe I'm actually also interested in detecting uh, tools and not just programming languages. So the, the um, this. Yeah, so I'm, for now, I just want to stick to solving the programming language problem. But I definitely recognize that my understanding of the problem changed here. Um, yeah, depending on the use case, maybe a, uh, a programming language is similar to a tool because a programming language is just a tool. Um, I might touch upon this topic in a later video. Um, and for now, what I'll just do is I'll just uh, stick to the just detecting the programming language uh, problem. But I'm at least happy that I'm aware uh, that this type of issue might arise and it does seem like I f understand the failure scenario fairly well. So all in all, I would argue this is definitely a worthy approach, but I think it might be interesting to compare this to a more machine learning model and I will do that in the next video. So let's wrap up. So to wrap up, we now have a large collection of matcher patterns that serve as a baseline. I understand the approach and I can easily make changes to it. I'm happy with the end result, but I'm even more happy with the lessons I learned by labeling and, and taking an iterative approach. Labeling is something that should be celebrated, and it is important to get right. Next up, what I will do is I will replace the matcher. 
Since we now have a baseline, we can properly compare the current approach with the neural variant. And I'm kind of curious to see if the neural variant might be able to solve some problems uh, that we can't solve with the current approach. Um, I don't know if that will happen, but at least now I have a very good baseline to compare against. See you in the next video.